Good afternoon. Welcome. I'm thrilled to welcome you today to our annual Presidential Scholars Research Symposium. My name is Pamela Smith. I'm the director of the Center for Science and Society and chair of the Presidential Scholars in Society and Neuroscience. Our research symposium features scholars and their faculty mentors. You will be hearing from our second year scholars, Matthew Sachs and Raphael Garrity, who are excited to present on their ongoing projects this afternoon. If this is your first PSSN event, I want to quickly introduce you to the program, which is managed by the Center for Science and Society. The Presidential Scholars in Society and Neuroscience program facilitates cross-disciplinary collaborative research to advance our understanding of mind, brain, and behavior, bringing together talented early career scholars from various fields with faculty experts in neuroscience and in the humanities, arts, and social sciences. The program has developed a new paradigm for original integrative research and training. The program supports early postdoctoral scholars seed funding for cross-disciplinary research and various seminars, conferences, and other events. The Presidential Scholars Program is housed in the Center for Science and Society, a hub for researchers, scholars, and practitioners seeking to break down traditional disciplinary silos and enhance public understanding of science. The core of the program is our early career presidential scholars, postdoctoral scholars pursuing independent research on mind, brain, and behavior at the intersection of the humanities, natural, and social sciences. Each scholar receives tailored support for, the, for their project from at least two faculty members from different departments who have relevant knowledge and experience to help guide their research. Current mentors come from neuroscience, sociology, psychology, psychiatry, narrative medicine, music, philosophy, English, comparative literature, and other disciplines. The scholars and PSSN faculty are central in organizing interdisciplinary events. Due to the pandemic, our programming this year is all virtual. Make sure, you will make sure you join us on March 29th for When Humans Speak, Language Processing in Computers and Humans. We will have at least two additional events in the spring, so stay tuned for more information. Please visit our website to learn more about the program, sign up for our monthly newsletter, register for upcoming events, and access our vast video archive of previous seminars. Please follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram for the latest updates. The PSSN program would not be possible without the support of leadership at Columbia, including President Lee Bollinger and our steering committee members, Peter Berman, Michael Goldberg, Carol Mason, Valerie Purdy Greenaway, um, and Christopher Peacock. Faculty from across the university participate on the advisory committee, mentor our scholars, and volunteer to review and interview applicants. Thanks to all of you who have made our program an example of interdisciplinary achievement. We will be providing ways to keep in touch in the chat box throughout the event. Each scholar will now give a presentation followed by short responses, responses from each of the faculty mentors. I'll just note Matt has four mentors, Raphael has two, and we'll then open up things for audience questions using the chat feature. You can post your questions to the chat at any time I think given the number of mentors we have here, we probably will only have time for a couple of questions, but please do put them in the chat. And now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Matthew Sachs. Dr. Sachs investigates the neural and behavioral mechanisms involved in emotions and feelings in response to music. He received his PhD from USC, um, the Brain and Creativity Institute there, and his projects involve applying data-driven multivariate models to capture the patterns of neural activity that accompany uniquely human experiences with music, such as feelings of chills, pleasurable sadness, and nostalgia. Thank you, Pamela, and thank you for the PSSN in general for all the support and all my mentors as well. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the research that I've been doing. I uh, just wanna make sure everyone can hear me and everyone can see my screen. Great, okay. So we think about the emotions that we experience in everyday life, they're rarely static. They ebb and flow in terms of their intensity and stability. To demonstrate this, I often like to start off with a, a short film clip. So I'm gonna play a little clip here from the movie uh, Moonlight. And while you're watching the clip, I want you to pay attention to how the character's emotions as well as your own are changing over the course of the clip. So 
So what I like about this clip is how what I think the characters are feeling and subsequently how I'm feeling changes throughout the, the clip without really any dialogue or really like a complete understanding of what's happening in the story. With these simple changes to the music and to the facial features, we're carried through these different emotional states pretty naturally. The same is true with music. So if you think about something like Bohemian Rhapsody, for example, and the different themes throughout it, it's easy to see how from the beginning towards the end, as we transition to these different themes, how we're feeling and how the artists are intending us to feel are changing. It turns out that how we feel and when we transition from one emotional state to the other has social and mental health implications. So successful social interactions really depend on our abil ability to perceive emotions in others and then predict what they're gonna transition to in the future. So when people were asked, for example, in this particular study, what emotions they're feeling uh, randomly throughout the day over a period of weeks, a pattern emerges by which emotional states that are more likely to transition to one another are ones that are phenomenologically similar. So for example, anger is more likely to transition to something like sadness or fear than it is to something like pride or love. And it turns out that this pattern is somewhat disrupted uh, in the, in, in the uh, context of mental health. So people with anxiety and depression, there's an irregularity to the interplay and the variability of positive and negative emotional states over time. And yet despite the importance of affect dynamics for well-being and mental health, very little neuroscience research has been dedicated to understanding the changes in the brain systems that accompany these emotional changes. That being said, most of the work that's typically been used to induce emotions and look at neural states, uh, uh, neural responses to emotions have used either static images or short film clips and rarely assess felt emotions and their changes. One recent example I wanna highlight of this used uh, emotional gifts. So these very short clips that conveyed emotion pretty strongly. And they found that uh, several subcortical regions in addition to some others, the caudate, the butamen, the amygdala, the hippocampus and the thalama, thalamus showed brain activation patterns that were predictive of the emotional categories of the gifts. But again, this was not assessed dynamically and it was each GIF had, was associated with one particular emotional state. On the other hand, there are some neuroscience studies that have looked at uh, other types of changes over time, such as narrative or event changes in movies. In this particular study conducted by one of my mentors, Chris Baldassano, uh, participants watched one uh, episode of the movie Sherlock uh, while during fMRI, and then uh, in, uh, additionally rated when they felt that narrative changes were happening in the uh, TV show. And what he found was that there, these higher order cortical midline brain regions, such as the posterior medial cortex and the angular gyrus, this and this, uh, were sensitive to the, uh, the narrative transitions in the music based on their pattern of brain activity. So what I'm gonna talk about is some of my research and how we try to bring this gap between what's been done in terms of narrative transitions and what's going on with static emotions and using music to study the emotional dynamics of the brain. So just to go over what I've just discussed, emotions are dynamic and how we experience emotions over time has implications for our mental health and well-being. Yet these dynamic quality of emotions are rarely studied with neuroimaging. And using music, music I think is an ideal tool and kind of a uh, interesting tool to study emotion dynamics because it's able, as I've mentioned, and as I hope to conv convey over the course of my talk, it's able to transition between a different emotional states in terms of how we're feeling without language and without any accompanying visuals. So what we're gonna to try to do is we're gonna to try to develop musical stimuli that naturally induces emotion transi transitions in an optimized period of time so that we can study them with the brain. And our main research question are, do the, the brain regions that we know that are responding to emotional stimuli, are they also tracking emotion transitions as induced by music? So in order to uh, get at the type of stimuli that we can use to study emotion transitions, we really had to start from the bottom up. And so we asked four film composers um, to write us a completely new piece of music that had certain requirements. So we asked them to only use four instruments. We wanted to keep lower level uh, structural or acoustic features as similar as possible throughout this piece of music and only change the thing we're interested in, which is the emotions. So we asked them to keep the instruments the same. So they picked four instruments uh, and we asked them to take one of five possible emotional categories and try to convey that emotion for the duration of some period of time. So the emotional categories that we picked uh, were joy, calm, dreamy, nostalgia, sad, or anxious. 
And so the composers were th thought to think about these emotions as a, as a kind of emotional event, convey it for a period of time, and then naturally transition through their music and through their composition skills into another emotional state. And we set the tempo of this to be uh, uh, the same throughout the entire piece, just another one thing to control, and to be similar to the, the TR, the pulse sequence of the, of the brain scan, so that there's no interference when we eventually do use these stimuli with fMRI. What this resulted in was actually uh, two separate pieces. So we broke all the events. They wrote 35 different events. We broke them into two uh, just for fatigue purposes, really. And uh, by having this control over the stimuli that we created, we could also create separate versions of these. So you see in piece A, uh, uh, there are you know, eight different emotional events here, which uh, the pattern is then flipped in the, in the second version. So it's the same eight events, but what the preceding emotion was different. So if, if this particular calm event was preceded by a joyful event in piece A, it was preceded by a anxious event in piece B. And this is the same for, or, or in version two, and this is the same for piece B. The only difference between piece A and piece B is the same emotional categories, but different events. So I'm gonna play you one particular example of an emotional transition from piece A now that the composers wrote for us. So hopefully you were able to, able to see uh, one emotion state, something like joy uh, or excitement, transitioning there into sadness while keeping the instrumentation and the tempo the same. So, so far what we've done is we've had people listen to these four different versions behaviorally online using this online rating tool that we've developed. So people listen to those full 15 minutes of music. So they just had one of those four pieces. Uh, and then they were able to press on a keyboard uh, with, the, with the buttons on the keys what emotion they felt at any given moment, and then to then press that same emotion again when they felt that emotion kind of go away. So they're able to turn on any of these emotional states at any time while the piece was playing. So it looked something like this. And from that, we can plot across all people, uh, the number of people that put on or turned on or said that they were feeling an emotion at any given time point. And so what I'm plotting here is the, uh, Gray is the moments of transitions, uh, and the um, white is the actual events for the duration of one particular part of this piece. And you can see these peaks right around the transition points. So people were more likely to say that emotion was coming on or off right at the times when we'd expect them to. And this was significant if we kind of randomize when the events are occurring and see what we would get basically by chance, there were more people rating at the transition points than any other time in the um, piece. And now we're going to look at the kind of something, the same exact clip here, but now we're looking across the five different emotions, the number of people that turned each of those buttons on throughout the entire piece. And again, we see a pretty good pattern here where there's definitely some mixing of different emotions, which is completely understandable, very likely that people are going to experience more than one emotion while they're listening to these pieces. But we see these kind of dominant, uh, most people have things like anxious on during the anxious clip or calm on in the calm clip or happy on in the happy clip which is kind of a great validation. So this is kind of showing that people are really experiencing the emotions that we intended uh, based on the way that the composers wrote them and they're transitioning naturally at the time points that we predicted. And so let's take a look here. This is, the, this is two versions of the same piece. And so what this allows us to do now is we can actually look at how the context, i.e. the preceding emotional uh, event influence the ratings in terms of the timing and just both the quality of the ratings of, of a particular event. So for example, this is the same exact musical theme. Uh, this group of participants heard it preceded by anxious and this group of participants heard it preceded by calm, but musically these are exactly the same. And then we can actually assess statistically whether or not there's a difference in terms of the, the temporal component of the ratings and the actual quality of the ratings between the different versions. So how does context basically change our experience of these emotions? 
And so you, I, what, what we did for this is we broke up every different event into one of four categories. So is, did the uh, emotion, was it preceded by a completely different context or was it preceded by the same context? And for the sake of simplicity here, I'm gonna lump together sad and anxious as the same valence and calm and happy as the other valence. We don't have to do the analysis that way, but just for simplicity's sake, I'm gonna talk about it that way. And the other two categories would be the same for positive emotions. So then this is the same exact calm clip, but this is calm when it's preceded by happy, and this is calm when it's preceded by sad. So one thing we can do, for example, is we can look at the time to peak, basically how long it took uh, for most people to have this particular emotional rating on. And you can measure this distance here and then look at uh, whether or not that time to peak varies as a function of the context. And so what we found just so far in this preliminary ratings with 35 or so people is that for the negative valence context here, there was no real difference in the time to peak between the, um, uh, whether it was preceded by a different valence or the same valence. But in the happy, there does seem to be this difference. So people are more likely to turn on the intended emotion when the preceding emotion was of the same valence, for example. So the next step to do with this uh, that's been kind of put on hold mostly due to the pandemic, but should be coming relatively soon is to have people listen to these pieces uh, while we collect fMRI data. So the task structure will look like this. People will listen to either version A or, or one or two of both pieces, piece A and piece B. So they'll listen to roughly 30 minutes of music inside the scanner. And they're not gonna do anything, just listen. They're not gonna do any sort of rating. But then after we'll ask them, well, they'll, have, they'll do this uh, post-scanning recall task We'll, we'll play them a 10 second clip from somewhere within this piece and ask them, and, and completely out of order too, so not in the same order as they heard it. And we'll ask them a couple of questions about the intensity of their felt emotions, how much they remember it, um, how much they enjoyed it, uh, and et cetera. And then once we have this data, we can start modeling uh, brain transitions that are reflective of the emotion transitions. So there's a couple of ways that we can do this. So if you imagine, for example, so one way of, of thinking about um, a brain region that would be sensitive to emotion transition is it might make sense that the voxelwise activity in a region would be relatively stable within an emotional event, but then would change rapidly into a new stable pattern of activity. And this change would occur around the time points when we um, wrote an emotional transition. And so we can assess this in two ways. One way is a more hypothesis-driven way, where we start with our uh, musical events and the time points of emotion transitions. And then for a particular brain region, we calculate spatial correlations between every pairs of time points. So it'll look something like this. So on, we have basically time by time on each axis. And this is the spatial correlation at each time point, uh, at, at each pair of time points. And then we can bin those correlations based on whether or not they happened within an emotional event or across emotional events. So across these black bounds or within these black bounds. And if, there, if the region is sensitive to emotion transitions, we would expect to see this sort of boxy pattern. This would mean that there's high correlation in, very, in, in time points that are within an event and then lower correlations in time points that are across events. So by mapping when the events are expected to occur onto the with, and, and, and then calculating the within versus across correlation, regions that show high within versus across, this suggests that those regions would be sensitive to emotion transitions. And we can then assess this using permutation testing to see which regions would be significant. Another way of doing this is a more data-driven way. So instead of giving uh, the brain when the events are likely to occur, let's look at purely the brain data and try to figure out when the, when, uh, the brain is transitioning into states just purely on brain data and then seeing if those time points map on to our emotional transition points that we know. So one way of doing this is by fitting a hidden Markov model. And the algorithm tries to determine based on the observable pattern of voxelwise activity in a region, underlying stable states, uh, and as well as the timing of those transitions. So what we give this model is we give it a number of, of K trend of events that we wanted to model. And then for the entire duration of the brain data that we have, the model tries to predict uh, basically how likely uh, is uh, uh, this brain region in a particular state at any given moment in time, as well as a spatial pattern for each of those events. And so in this way, we can then compare where the model thinks an emotion uh, an, a brain state transition is, see how well those map onto our emotional state transitions, 
do this same sort of shuffling of permutation testing to determine which regions, again, are sensitive to the emotion transitions. And then finally, we can assess the effect of emotional context in the same way that we did behaviorally by looking at the patterns of activation for a particular event and how those patterns vary as a function of the preceding context, as well as the timing of a transition between states uh, based on the, the context. So do, does the HMM show a transition point later in time if the preceding context is of a different valence and if it's the same? So I wish I could have tell you more about the, uh, what the brain is actually doing while it's listening to these music stimuli. But again, as I said, we haven't yet collected the fMRI data, but I do have some insights from an existing data set with film. Um, I've been working on this data set in which, um, in which adolescents were watching 10 minutes of the clip Despicable Me. This is a completely publicly available data set. Independently, we used the same rating tool that I was showing you that we did with music and asked people to tell us when they felt uh, emotions and emotional changes. And we can then plot those time points and get a sense of when, we, um, when emotional transitions are happening within the movie. And then we can assess which brain regions are sensitive to those emotions just in the exact same way that I have. And so far, it looks like from this data set, I'm gonna show you those same time point by time point correlation matrices for three particular regions for two different scenes in the Despicable Me clip. Uh, and these are regions that we hypothesize might be involved in emotion transitions, given their involvement in emotional processing more generally. And you can, and so I'm just applying the time point at time point co correlations for the three of them. And these three uh, statistically showed that the HMM transition points mapped onto the behavioral moments of transitions. Uh, there were also a number of subcortical regions in addition to these regions that were uh, sensitive to emotion transitions. So we can start with those regions uh, once we collect fMRI data with the film clip as a, a good strong uh, proxy for where we think emotion transitions will occur when response to music. So just some concluding thoughts here. It does seem that our newly composed non-lyrical music can induce emotional dynamics similar to those experienced in everyday life and in response to films. And those timings of transition seem to be altered by the preceding context. And fMRI data with an existing film set su uh, suggests that both cortical and subcortical regions that are sensitive to emotions in general seem to be tracking emotion transitions in response to a movie. And so this forthcoming fMRI study will test if these regions are sensitive to emotional uh, changes in the music stimuli as well. And then we can additionally assess this uh, kind of context manipulation in terms of brain state transitions. So hopefully these findings will expand our current knowledge of uh, emotions by extending them to this concept of emotion and transitions, and then generalize so we can find findings both from film, everyday life, and now musical stimuli as well. And so I just want to thank uh, all four of my mentors for all their work and help uh, making this project a reality and, uh, hopefully, and the work that they will continue to do as it goes forward. And with that, I want to open it up to the panel discussion. Thank you so much, Matt. That was terrific. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Matt's mentors now to respond. Uh, Christopher Peacock goes first from philosophy. Okay, so uh, Matt, th this is terrific. Very original, very important work. Um, it's no accident, I think, that Matt has um, mentors from four different disciplines. Uh, perception of music is enormously complex and interesting phenomenon from the point of view of all of those different disciplines. Um, in this very short time available, I'd like to just mention two issues that are sort of further down the road that are raised um, sharply by what uh, Matt talked about. Um, first issue is conceptual. Second one is broadly computational stroke representational. Um, the conceptual issue um, is this, as Matt said, um, almost his first sentence, that the emotions ebb and flow in intensity um, uh, in our life, when we're listening to music, when we're watching a movie and so forth. Um, one of the interesting things in the perception of music is that you, you hear quite specific degree of, um, of joy or sadness, uh, music, any particular point in the music. Um, and uh, what's interesting is the way in which that emotion is given to you in the music. It's not just it's of a specific degree, but you, you hear it in such a way, you hear that emotion in the music in such a way that you know what it's like to have that emotion. You know what it's like to have that emotion. Um, just as in the case of certain other mental states, when you imagine being sad in a particular way, you know what it's like to be in that kind of state. Um, and similarly, with some kinds of imagination. Um, uh, and that's enormously important, interesting from the point of view of aesthetics, from the point of view of perception, from the point of view of mental representation. It means that you, 
you always have a certain kind of acquaintance with the emotions or perhaps the other mental states that are expressed in the music. Um, from the point of view of aesthetics, um, that immediately begins to make sense of the, the whole enterprise, for example, of setting, setting words to music. You get something much more specific, fine-grained, um, emotional, perhaps action modality, some other mental state um, in the music that's, that sets the particular words. Um, you have um, the phenomenon of a certain limited kind of ineffability here. Um, you hear specific, a specific emotion in the music, but of course, you can say that emotion, um, that degree of it, but um, you need to experience it to um, that's not exactly what it is. Uh, so that's one class of issues. One class of issues is really characterizing that, that cluster of phenomena, a specific degree of, of the um, emotion heard in the music, um, this kind of acquaintance relation that it involves, and its aesthetic consequences. And of course, um, that also raises questions about how that's mentally represented in the brain. What is this way of representing a specific degree of emotion? that involves um, familiarity with what it's like to be in that emotional state. So that's one class of issues, um, very sharply raised by Matt's work, um, enormous interest. The second one is um, also something that's partly conceptual, but really basically representational. Um, one of the things that comes out very clearly in Matt's work is that um, you perceive certain features of the music metaphorically as involving certain kinds of emotions. That the notion of experiencing one thing metaphorically as something else is really, really important um, in describing the phenomena accurately. And whenever you've got metaphor involved in any kind of perceptual or cognitive state, when there's metaphor, there has to be an isomorphism. Um, and when there's an isomorphism that's involved in um, some psychological phenomenon, there's a question then of how it's represented, how it's exploited. Um, you know, we, we, you could try to write out an isomorphism in, in language, saying what the function is, what the structure preserving mapping is from features of the music to features of the emotions. Um, but nobody thinks that there's kind of sentences of that kind in, in the brain. So there must be some way in the brain um, uh, we, that exploits a metaphorical mapping from one domain, perception of the musical features, to um, the emotional structure and to changes in the emotion and indeed capture the degree of the emotion. Um, how is that done? I don't. I think that at the moment we don't even know in the abstract how how to model that as a possible stru um, brain structure. But it's enormous, interesting, empirical, conceptual, and partly philosophical challenge. Um, all these questions are raised very, very sharply by Matt's work, and uh, congratulate him on the progress so far. Raising further questions is just what we want. So thank you very much. Excellent work, Matt. Thank you, um, Professor Peacock. Next is uh, Professor Marius Kozak from Music. Thank you, Marius. I hope that um, that was clear to everybody. There's a little static there, but um, I think it came through. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now I'd like to introduce um, Professor Kevin Oxner from uh, Psychology. So, uh, you know, Matt, I love this project. You did a wonderful job uh, presenting it. And I just want to highlight three different themes uh, to think about as the project moves forward. Um, the first uh, relates to conversations that we've had a number of times and it has to do with what the goals are for the project and your research program more generally. I think uh, we've already heard a couple of really interesting um, responses to your talk that focused on music per se. Um, and I might highlight the flip side of uh, what you're focusing on or what you're studying, which is the event structure of emotion. Um, there's really not been much prior research on the way in which emotion transitions flow from one into another. There is dynamic emotion sampling in everyday life, but in terms of understanding uh, a combination of the psychological and neural mechanisms that are involved, our understanding is really relatively poor. And that leads me to the second uh, theme that I might highlight, which are the opportunities that this project and the related projects you're doing present to you, which I think in many ways are really, um, they're truly unique and in many ways unprecedented in part because of the stimuli that you've created and the power that that gives you uh, in terms of flexibly creating studies and analyzing the data. So you can, you presented behavioral data about pairwise transitions from one emotional state to another and how the shift of valence from say a negative to a positive state or a positive to a negative state 
might matter. But you also suggested with the types of computational models you'll apply, ways in which you can look at longer event histories. And I think this presents a really exciting opportunity to look at what in the lab um, we have kind of informally called affective landscapes, which is the way in which affective states flow together across time and have the experience of any one state, if taken in isolation, will be different than when considered in the context of its surrounding kind of emotional uh, landscape elements. I think you have a really unique opportunity to study that there. And then in addition, um, I might encourage you to think about the way in which the experience of the transitions in the piece and the pieces as a whole um, involve a kind of emergent experience of the pieces in totality rather than the elements. So we're tempted in the creation of stimuli like this, where you have a great deal of precision and control. And it's really, as I, as I mentioned, and I think Marius really so beautifully laid out, it's a very unique stimulus set with unique opportunities. But just think about the way in which the experience of the piece as a whole and the way in which it ends in particular ends up shaping the neural representation of your the entire piece and the way in which you remember it going forward. And then finally, I might just make a comment about um, how you can think about results going forward. Um, you're gonna neurally identify regions um, in a variety of ways, some of which you highlighted in the presentation today. And I just, I would just encourage you to think um, as carefully and complexly as possible about um, the different reasons you might be identifying regions in the context of your analyses. So one possibility is that they're involved in um, identifying the transition from one affective state to another. And those regions might play a really key role in encoding our experiences into memory as we segment things into individual packets uh, or events or episodes to be encoded more deeply into memory. But there are gonna be other regions that are involved in various other aspects of your experience of the emotion from a musical piece or from a film clip. Um, and they can include regions that represent the continuous stream of experience, regions that are involved in reflecting on and interpreting the nature of that experience. Regions that might be involved in selecting among the various ways that you might label or describe your experience. And in part, the uh, preliminary data that you presented from the child mind Despicable Me data set, it looks an awfully lot like data from um, another study uh, from a prior postdoc in the lab, as chance may have it, that was expressly about what brain regions are involved when people introspect on and try to interpret affective states, especially ones that are ambiguous or that are complex and difficult to interpret. Where you see regions on the midline of your frontal lobe that might be involved in representing uh, or integrating various mental representations to comprise the experience, qua experience of the event, <clears throat> other regions on the lateral portions of your frontal lobe that might be important for selecting among the various competing interpretations and posterior regions that could be involved in either representing semantic aspects of the stimulus or, or other social kind of evocative aspects interpreting the meaning of the stimulus. So in short, I think you have a tremendous number of opportunities here that are really unprecedented to um, explore incredibly important questions. And I'm really excited to see what you eventually uh, find when COVID permits us to finally collect these data. Thank you so much, Professor Oxner. Um, Professor Baldassano, Christopher Baldassano from Psychology. Uh, yes, thanks, Matt, and thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, I'll just echo what uh, the other mentors have, have said. This is uh, a really exciting project that uh, it's been really uh, amazing to see take shape while uh, Matt's been working with us. Um, and so for me, a lot of my, uh, my research is trying to think about ways that we can understand how we can take a lot of these psychological phenomena that we usually study in very controlled settings and how can we um, think about the way that they really interact with realistic kinds of everyday stimuli. Um, and so there's this, this, this sort of tough tension between um, do we sort of try to break apart the pieces of our everyday experience into these uh, sort of very reduced pieces that we have a lot of control over and we can make very uh, well-controlled kinds of experiments with um, versus do we kind of embrace 
all of the messiness of uh, real world art and experience and memory. Um, and so Matt has found a really interesting way to um, to kind of bridge these tensions and create this kind of stimulus that um, does have a very tightly controlled kind of experimental structure to it, um, but still retains all these kinds of natural, dynamic, interesting properties we want to study. Um, and so this is a hard thing to do. I mean, when we're trying to study these kinds of things in music and art and narratives, um, we don't yet have computers that could automatically generate these kinds of compelling stimuli for us. And so um, it involves, um, you know, looping in people from all of these different fields to construct these kinds of stimuli. Um, and so having this, this kind of experiment is a way that um, lets us really answer these very, very directly these questions about natural experience, um, while still being able to run the kind of statistical tests that we want to answer these scientific questions. Um, and it's a especially interesting part of, of music for me um, as a psychologist is that music has all of this interesting temporal structure to it that um, you know the the note that you're currently hearing depends a lot on the the context of the previous uh, all uh, sort of both recent notes that you're hearing as well as the overall flow of the song um, and as Matt was talking about about prior uh, emotional context as well that maybe extend back um, tens of seconds or minutes into the past. Um, and there's lots of regions in the brain that I'm interested in that do this kind of integration over time that really care about keeping track of where you currently are um, in your experience or in the song um, and comparing what you're hearing now to what you've just heard. And so it's really just impossible to study those brain regions without having some kind of interesting temporal structure in the stimulus. And so um, this, these kinds of, uh, of songs, these kinds of event structured songs that Matt's been building um, are really a great window into how the brain can do this kind of processing at all of these different timescales. Um, and so, yeah, I'm really uh, excited that when we'll have the opportunity to start collecting fMRI data for this project. Thank you very much, Professor Baldassano. Uh, Matt, do you want to take just a minute to respond to any of that? It's it's just interesting to hear everyone's different perspectives and how much I'm realizing now that I've been influenced by them without kind of realizing it. Like the context thing is very much in line with a lot of the effective landscaping things that Kevin and I have talked about. Getting film composers in the first place was a lot of conversations that I've had with Marius. The kind of time locked structural nature of these and when things transition and how much control we have that was very much in, inspired by my talks with Chris. And then the categories and how we asked people the question of what they were feeling and what the um, what terms we used and what acoustic elements went into conveying those terms are very much in line with the conversations I've had with Chris Peacock in terms of like a perception of an emotion and what that actually means. So it's just, it's actually, I didn't actually think I was listening during those meetings, but it kind of sounds like now I was and I've somehow incorporated these, all these things into this project now. Not that I was intentionally not listening, but that it was just a lot of that going on. I didn't know how I'd be able to incorporate all these things going on, but somehow it seems like there's a little bit here of, of, of all my uh, uh, conversations with everyone. Uh, thank you, Matt. That's wonderful. And it really shows the way that the Presidential Scholars Program works. It's um, really intense conversations among really stimulating different perspectives. And, you know, it, it, it happens by, by this kind of collaborative work. It's really wonderful. Um, unfortunately, we're going to have to speed right along to our next speaker. Um, but I want to thank um, you, uh, Matt, and all of your mentors. And we're going to move on now to um, uh, Dr. Rafael Garrity. Um, Dr. Rafael Garrity is a neuroscientist interested in computational and philosophical models of representation in the brain. He received his PhD in psychology from Columbia, where he researched the role of large-scale brain network dynamics in reward learning. His work as a presidential scholar focuses on whether and how our brains may, might make use of probability to represent uncertainty. I'm going to give the floor now to um, Dr. Garrity. Okay, I just want to start by presenting a sort of big picture to the approach that I'm trying to take with this project, um, which I hope is a multifaceted approach to understanding something that I'm going to try to convince you is both an important concept, but also a pretty fuzzy one. And that's how our brains manage to represent uncertainty. And the reason that it's multifaceted is because we're trying to develop a theoretical framework that takes this fuzzy idea and, and makes it clear and allows it to make clear empirical 
predictions that we can test experimentally. Um, and we also want to develop computational models that can link these theoretical ideas to empirical observations. Now, I just want to point out two things about this map um, before I start. One is that, as Matt alluded to, um, I also don't have any uh, brain imaging data to show. So this is pretty aspirational for now. Um, but what I hope to show is that this theoretical framework that we've developed does point towards some specific experiments and make some clear um, experimental predictions. And I will also be sharing some preliminary results from computational um, modeling work that we've been doing. I also just want to point out that this kind of work really wouldn't be possible without the Presidential Scholars Program. Really being able to build the bridges between these the different facets of this approach has taken work um, with philosophers and, and neuroscientists like my advisors, um, John Morrison and Nico Kriyus Quartin. So now I, want, I just want to convince you that studying uncertainty is, a, is an interesting thing to do. Um, and the reason for that is that it sort of surrounds us in every aspect of our, our lives. And not just in sort of high level things like making decisions or our knowledge of facts, but even just the um, basic facts about perception. So here's a picture that it's probably hard to tell whether you're looking at a rabbit or a bird. And this kind of uncertainty is around us all the time. So organisms must respond appropriately to uncertain information in every facet of their lives. Many of the environmental features we're trying to extract from the world around us are underdetermined by the sensory data that we're using to extract them. There are multiple sources of this uncertainty. So as is the case with the rabbit or bird, there are multiple environmental causes that are consistent with the same sensory input. So this picture could be caused by a bird or a rabbit. Our sensory organs transform this input with noise or information loss. Our, the responses our brain uses to process this information happens with random variability. And in any given context, the environmental features we're seeing might not align with our prior experiences. Now, many, if not all organisms behave in a way that's robust to this uncertainty. Like we're able to get around in the world despite everything that I just said. And some organisms, in, including humans, seem to be able to track uncertainty directly. So one study that I think is a nice illustration of this is from Bruce Bay Keani and, and Mike Shadlin. Um, in this study, monkeys were looking at uh, an image of randomly moving dots. Most of the dots were moving in one direction or another, left or right, and they just had to indicate with an eye um, gaze which way the dots were moving. Now, what's special about this experiment is the monkeys had an opt-out um, option on some trials where they could choose a sure target to get a little bit of juice. Um, and on other trials, they had to choose left or right. And what the study showed is that when the stimuli were more noisy or presented for a shorter period of time, the monkeys were more likely to opt out for the sure bet. And they did better. They got more juice when they had the option of opting out. And this shows that the monkeys seem to be able to track uncertainty in an appropriate way. Results like these uh, lead, have led a lot of researchers and philosophers to argue um, that perhaps we represent the world probabilistically, that even our early perceptual systems use probability uh, to represent uncertainty about the things we're trying to detect. And there are a few reasons why this is appealing. One is that probability is supposed to provide a normative account that tells us how we should um, represent and respond to uncertainty. The other is that one other is that it can unify otherwise distinct processes in the brain. So there's some parsimony um, to the idea of probabilistic representations. It can provide an adaptive role for variability in behavior or brain activity that we as experimenters might otherwise treat as noise. But the concept has been quite controversial, and I'll try and briefly um, give some examples of why. And that's the focus of my work in the Presidential Scholars Program. I'm going to try and present today a theoretical framework that I've been working on um, that asks what is a probabilistic representation and how can we know if our brains have them. I want to show that that leads to some clear experimental predictions and just give a proposed an experimental proposal for how we might detect probabilistic representations in early visual cortex. And finally, give some preliminary results from a computational model that we've been working on using artificial neural networks to model the computations that might underlie 
probabilistic representation. So I'll start with the theoretical framework. For the most part, you're just gonna have to trust me that there's a lot of controversy here. I don't have time um, to delve into it very deeply, but I will just give one example returning um, to this bistable illusion um, that I alluded to earlier. This is an image that's one of the oldest examples of, of an illusion like this. I think it's around 800 years old from a temple in India. And when you look at it, you should feel yourself going back and forth between seeing an ox standing in front of an animal and seeing an elephant standing in front of another animal. Um, and some researchers and philosophers will look at that process and say, your brain has a statistical model of the world and it's using that to come up with its best, most, most probable um, representation of what you're looking at at any given time, be it an ox or an elephant. Other researchers and philosophers will look at the same phenomena and say, this is clear evidence that we don't represent probabilistically because you certainly see an ox sometimes and you certainly see an elephant other times. There's no reason to invoke the representation of uncertainty to describe what your perceptual system is doing when you look at, at this picture. So again, that's just one example um, that I just want to use to illustrate the fact that the terms of this debate have so far not been well defined. Researchers and philosophers use different criteria as evidence for or against the existence of probabilistic representations in the visual system, for example. And worse, as I'll point out in a second, some of these criteria point to the idea of a representation being probabilistic as an arbitrary label that just depends on how you choose to interpret the data. So if we look at the work that's been done before and, and, and try and ask how are people defining probabilistic representation, we get a lot of, of different answers. So some commonly used criteria involves representations that are uh, represent Bayesian inference. So if your brain is, is, is representing the most probable um, outcome given some statistical model, that might be a probabilistic representation. If our perceptual system has representations that are influenced by prior beliefs or experiences, that's sometimes used as a hallmark of probabilistic representation. Or if we can decode probability from brain activity. And there are others that I won't um, go into here. All of the previous criteria face a number of problems. I'm going to focus on two that we've isolated um, just to, to, uh, to illustrate this. The two issues that I want to describe, the first is representational ambiguity, is the term that we're using for this problem. And it's simply the problem that there are many stimulus features that might be correlated with uncertainty. So if you're in a dark room trying to detect the size of an object in front of you, and I'm measuring your brain activity and visual cortex while changing the degree of light in the room, I might find that that brain activity correlates with your uncertainty about the size of the object. But it's certainly possible that that brain area is, is actually only representing or responding to the degree of light or darkness in the room. And there's no need for us to invoke uncertainty to describe it. So representational ambiguity is just the idea that it's not always clear that uncertainty is being represented at all. Another problem is model indeterminacy. And this is a little more complicated, but it's just the idea that there's some statistical model that can make almost any function look probabilistic. So if I know the computation that a certain neuron, say, is doing in the brain, I can often design a statistical model for which that function is going to be statistically optimal and, and might look like it's following um, probabilistic inference. This is just to say it's not always clear that probability is what a brain region is representing. So our solution to both of these problems is, is twofold. The two main components of our framework are first that probabilistic representations have to be invariant representations of uncertainty. And what that means is that distinct sensory inputs can lead to the same uncertainty representation. So to return to the dark room, if, if I want to say that the brain area is representing uncertainty about the size of the object you're looking at, I should be able to get the same representation by, say, putting a fog machine in the room. As long as the fog makes you equally uncertain about the size, that should lead to the same representation in V1 if that's a representation of uncertainty. The second component is that the signature of probabilistic representation is what other neurons use it for. So do other parts of your brain treat a representation like a probability distribution? And we conceptualize that with the, the computational motif of marginalization. So we're calling marginalization 
canonical probabilistic computation. And just to illustrate what that means, we're basically talking about taking weighted sums over the, the multiple possibilities that a brain area is representing, if it's representing probabilistically. And we put this in terms of taking expectations. So if you imagine flipping a coin, and if I tell you it comes up heads, you get $10. If it comes up tails, you get $0. The expected value of that coin is, is $5, because it's 0.5 times 10 plus 0.5 times 0. These are the computations that we're using as canonical probabilistic computations. So in this framework, a probabilistic representation must reflect uncertainty in the form of multiple possibilities and be treated like a probability distribution in downstream computation. So some other brain region must be taking expectation using this representation. This points to two pretty specific um, pieces of evidence we could find for probabilistic representation. So evidence should show that the representation is invariant to the source of uncertainty. So in the size case, it could be either light or fog that's causing the uncertainty, but you should get the same representation of it. And finally, the representation must be marginalized over in downstream computation. So to illustrate how that leads to clear um, experimental predictions, I'm just gonna sketch an experiment that we'd hope to run when, when things get um, back up and running at the Zuckerman Institute. This would be an experimental proposal for detecting probabilistic representations in, in early visual cortex. So it's, it's a simple task. We'll show participants a screen like this, and we're going to flash on the screen a visual grading. And your job would be to say whether the top of the grading is pointing to the right or the left. So that should be clear. That one was pointing to the left. And what we're going to do is reward participants if they get it right by giving them a little money, taking away a little money if they get it wrong. And to force people to marginalize over their uncertainty, we're going to use asymmetric rewards. So if you guessed right and you got it correct, you would get the same amount of money. But if you guessed right and you got it wrong, you would lose more money than if you guessed left and got it wrong. And so what this should push participants to do to make the most money is to weight their uncertainty. So if you're uncertain about the stimulus, you should be biased away from choosing right. So just to illustrate that again, here's a stimulus that should be relative clear, and we can relatively clear, and we can manipulate your uncertainty by changing the contrast of that stimulus. So here's another example, a lower contrast. That should have been a little harder. You should have been a little more uncertain about it. And one specific thing we're going to take advantage of is we can manipulate that uncertainty in multiple ways. So this is another stimulus with the same contrast as before. And now we're, I'm just going to manipulate the spatial frequency of the grading. So this next stimulus is going to be the same contrast, but you should be more uncertain about it. So I hope that just illustrates that we can take these two different low-level sensory features and get a manipulation of your uncertainty about which way that grading is pointing. Um, and just to review, we can do that by changing the contrast of the grading or by changing the spatial frequency. And we'll train participants to maximize reward on this task that requires marginalization. We'll train them only in the contrast condition and then test them on this other condition with the expectation that they'll generalize to the new source of uncertainty. This is a pretty boring task, which is exactly how we want it. We want to be very confident in how participants are going to behave because the real goal is to scan people's brains while they're doing it, to, to tell whether early visual regions are representing only these low level sensory features like frequency and contrast, or they're actually representing uncertainty about orientation. So we'll have participants in an MRI scanner where we can measure changes in blood flow to indirectly get a sense of brain activity. And from that brain activity, we'll decode how uncertain they were about their decisions. Now, the unique contribution we'll make here is training the decoder to predict uncertainty only in one condition, say the contrast condition, so that the decoder will only see brain activity while we're changing contrast, and then we'll test it. This is called cross decoding on the frequency condition. And the idea is that if the visual cortex actually contains a probabilistic representation of orientation, this cross decoding should work. So the decoder that's only seen contrast should be able to decode or should be able to decode uncertainty in the frequency condition. Okay, so that would tell us that the brain 
um, contains probabilistic representations, but it wouldn't tell us very much about how the brain manages to do this. So what kinds of computations underlie probabilistic representation? And for that, we started work on designing neural networks based on neuroscience models of probabilistic representation. And I'm just gonna share some preliminary um, results here. So when we do this, we're asking what kinds of computations could possibly be used to produce the representations that we're hoping to detect. Specifically, we want a model for how the brain might encode uncertainty that we can test and train on arbitrary stimuli. So we want sort of a level playing field when we compare our models to the brain. I wanna be able to show this model any picture, for example, that I can show the brain. The problem with this is that most neural theories are pretty rigid in their inputs. So for orientation, they might just take the number, the value of the orientation as an input rather than um, an actual picture. Neural networks, which are one of the most dominant um, paradigms in artificial intelligence, do take in the kinds of stimuli we want, but they don't represent probabilistically according to our framework. So what we're trying to do here is, is part of what's been called a virtuous cycle, where we use our knowledge of neuroscience to make better artificial intelligence, and then we use that artificial intelligence to make better models of the brain. Specifically, I'm gonna talk about implementing a computation called stochastic divisive normalization that might provide a general mechanism for encoding probability. To tell you about that, I just need to take a small step back and, and talk about something called gain variability. It's not that important what gain variability is, but you can think of it as a property of, of neurons in the visual cortex that indexes how much they vary in their overall activity from one stimulus to the other. And the reason I'm talking about it is because it's very recently been shown to correlate strongly with uncertainty about orientation in stimuli like I, sh I showed earlier. Specifically, it's able, it seems able to track uncertainty from multiple sources. So in the past six months or so, a paper was published where authors, the authors actually manipulated uncertainty in two different ways. Here's, like I mentioned earlier, contrast manipulation, and they also manipulated spread, which is just sort of jittering the direction of the orientation. And what they showed is that both of these manipulations affect gain variability. So gain variability might be encoding uncertainty regardless of the sensory source of that uncertainty. So in this plot, you can see that for low contrast stimuli, gain variability is higher than for high contrast stimuli. And for both levels of contrast, as the spread increases, the gain variability increases. So this is the first evidence that we've seen for the kind of framework that we have described earlier, but that's not why I'm showing it here. I'm showing it because the authors proposed a possible computational mechanism that could lead that gain variability to depend on properties of the stimuli. And that's called stochastic divisive normalization. Now divisive normalization is a canonical computation. We think it happens all over the brain in many species. And it's pretty simple. It's the idea that the activity of a neuron is divided by the activity of neurons that are surrounding it. Um, and that normalizes the activity. And our hypothesis is that if we implement this stochastic divisive normalization in a more image computable model, like a neural network, that those models will be able to encode uncertainty and we can eventually use them as models of the brain. We're gonna test this encoding of uncertainty in two ways. We're gonna see whether these neural networks become robust to unseen nu nuisance variables. So if we manipulate images in ways the network hasn't seen before, is it robust to those manipulations? And we're gonna ask whether the confidence of these networks and their predictions is better calibrated. Calibrated confidence just means that the confidence tracks accuracy closely. So if you're 80% confident in a decision, you should be right in that decision 80% of the time. And if you're 40% confident, you should be right 40% of the time and so on. Because we're gonna use neural networks, I just briefly wanna to give an overview of, of what these things um, do and look like. So this is a, a representation of a very basic neural network. Like I said earlier, we like these because they can take in the kinds of stimuli that brains take in, and they seem they reflect some abstract computational properties of, um, of our brains. So this is a fully connected network, which just means that each node, which is one of these um, gray circles, is connected to all of the nodes in the layer above and in the layer below by weights, which are the black edges here. Now we'll present these networks with an, 
an image in, in this case, and the input layer, each unit in the input layer contains the value of one pixel in the input image. And let's just focus on one unit in the hidden layer. This unit is gonna take all of the input layer activity, so all the pixel values, multiply them by the weights represented by these edges and sum them up. And this will happen at every unit in the network until eventually it makes a guess in the output layer and it tells you how confident it is about every possible digit. Let's say in this case that it's early in training and it thinks it's season eight. We basically tell it that it's wrong and we use that to update the weights to make it closer to being right next time. And after training like this over and over again, it'll eventually be able to know that it's looking at a three right now. So we've designed a, a novel um, neural network that basically makes some small changes to what I just showed you. So to illustrate those, I just flipped the network vertically so that now the input layer is on the bottom and we're still showing it this digit, calling the input layer X. And let's just focus on a unit in the hidden layer we'll call unit I. So this network starts like the other network. Unit I sums up all the pixel values by multiplying, after multiplying them by these weights W, and that's followed by some simpler, simple nonlinear activation function. And what we've added is a set of lateral weights connecting unit I to all of the other units in this hidden layer. We'll call those weights P, and that's what's used for the normalization. So the activity G in this unit is now just normalized by the weighted sum of all its neighboring units, and that normalization has some noise associated with it. And then the, the unit's um, activity has a, is, is the product of another noise source. But that's not important for our purposes. We're gonna train these networks on the kind of stimuli I've been showing you so far, these handwritten digits, and we'll train them with no sources of noise in the images, so they'll just see digits that look like this. After training, we'll test them on what we call out of distribution manipulations. And this just means that they can no longer learn now that they're seeing these new images. And these images are different from what they've seen during training. We're going to manipulate these test images by changing the contrast and by adding pixel noise. So that during testing, the, the network might see an image that looks like this or an image that looks like that. And we're going to see how, how accurately it's able to respond to these changes compared to standard uh, neural networks. So on the x-axis here, I'm pl plotting contrast. And on the y-axis, I'm plotting accuracy. And what you can see is that compared to a standard neural network, the stochastic divisive normalization model is more robust. Its accuracy stays high, even at very low contrast values that it's never seen before. We can simil similarly look at increasing pixel noise. And we also see that the stochastic divisive normalization model is robust to increases in, uh, in pixel noise that it's never seen before. I also mentioned that we wanted to look at confidence calibration. So here I'm plotting confidence calibration for um, images at a, a medium noise level as illustrated by this example. Confidence is on the x-axis, accuracy is on the y-axis. So perfect confidence where when you're 50% confident you get it right 50% of the time would be illustrated by a diagonal line here, which I'll show in green and closer to the green line is, is more is better calibrated. And again, we can see that the stochastic divisive normalization model is better calibrated than standard neural network. We can also look at images with no noise, but low contrast. And we also see that the, the stochastic model is, is better than the standard model. And finally, we can look at um, manipulating both at the same time. And unsurprisingly, um, the model we designed is, is better calibrated than the standard neural network. So in summary, we've developed a framework that is useful, we think, for studying probabilistic representations. One of the ways that it's useful is that it leads to um, specific experimental predictions. The framework is based on ideas of source invariance and marginalization, and we're currently planning experiments for detecting probabilistic representations in early sensory cortex. We've also designed neural network models based on neuroscientific theories of probabilistic encoding. And we have some preliminary evidence that they're more robust and better calibrated than standard neural networks. And the ultimate goal is to use them to model brain activity and behavior. So future plans for the fellowship, we need to publish our theoretical framework um, paper so that other people can read it. 
when we're back up and running, we do want to run brain imaging experiments to see whether we can detect probabilistic representations in sensory cortex. And we want to beef up these neural network models to make them closer to the way uh, to the architecture of the visual system. We want better comparison networks. Um, we want to test how uncertainty is encoded in these networks and also train them on tasks that requires marginalization, because that is a big part of um, the framework that I that I described earlier. The ultimate goal is going to be to compare our neural network models directly to brain activity and behavior on the same tasks once we have brain activity and behavior on those tasks. So with that, I just want to say thank you to my advisors, to everybody at PSSN, um, my collaborators and, and fellow lab members, and, and thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Rafael. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to turn now to Rafael's mentors. Um, first, we're going to hear from Nicholas Kriegeskorte from Psychology and Neuroscience. Great. Thank you, Tamala. So I think Rafael has a, a really genuinely multidisciplinary project, and I'm really excited to be along for the ride. Um, it's really great. And uh, another side effect of all of this and of the PSSN is that Raphael has introduced me to John Morrison, and John and I have been talking independently. So the three of us are meeting, and you know, John and I, and John and Raphael, and me and Raphael, um, all are having sort of regular meetings now. So this has really been a great inspiration to me that goes um, beyond our current project and it's going to have a bigger impact on what my, my lab does. I think this um, project of Raphael uh, about probabilistic representation is really, in a sense, the central project in the intersection of philosophy and neuroscience. I think of representations as a kind of high level way of coping with the complexity and making sense of things so we can measure the neural activity in the brain. Um, one level up from these measurements, we can characterize it with the tools of information theory. And then one level up yet, we can describe it in terms of representational accounts. And this adds something essential, namely intentionality, the idea that this activity is about something, about something in the world so this links the activity in the brain to its function in the context of the behavior of an animal in its natural environment. And that's how we make sense of things. So representation is a cognitive concept, but interestingly, it's a concept that's been absolutely irresistible to neuroscience and neuroscientists, and it's central to primate electrophysiology. And on the one hand, there we have uh, really rigorous and exciting measurements of brain activity that promise to ground cognition in what's going on in the brain. But at the same time, um, there is sometimes a, a somewhat philosophically naive way that we neuroscientists use concepts of representation. And I think that's one reason why uh, the PSSN is so important and this project is so important um, to make uh, space for this multidisciplinary, um, careful approach, of really looking at the problem from the perspectives of these different disciplines and, um, and putting the pieces together. And then, so the, the other element, of course, is the, the probabilistic element. And that uh, adds major complications, namely the fact that we must keep track of a multiplicity of possibilities in order to make good inferences and decisions. And uh, these inferences and decisions require that we marginalize across um, all the variables of no interest so that in the end, we've, we've taken into account all these, these different possibilities um, in our inferences and decisions. So I'm excited that uh, Raphael is on the one hand exploring the philosophical literature and taking time to do theoretical work um, to make sense of the already complex and sophisticated literature in computational neuroscience, which uh, I have followed closely, but am nevertheless still confused by. And so I'm, I'm super happy uh, with Raphael to make some uh, progress just understanding what's already out there. And then also, I'm super excited about um, the way that Raphael is going beyond this literature with a contribution that really takes both 
both of these perspectives uh, seriously and puts the pieces together in a computational model that can perform these kinds of um, tasks uh, while relating to you know, very, very recent and interesting uh, neurophysiological results. So um, really excited to be on board and it's been an amazing intellectual adventure for me. And I, I look forward to seeing where, where Raphael takes this. Thank you so much. Uh, John Morrison from Philosophy. Right, thanks very much. I'll just say quickly that it's been a tremendous um, joy to be a part of this project and I've learned a lot too. I'll just quickly mention four areas that Raphael might want to think about as he moves forward. Um, one is um, how his theory of probabilistic representation mixes together with a more general theory of representation. So um, if you know some brain region, one question is whether a brain region represents orientations or some other variable. Another question is whether it's representing them using probabilities. And so Raphael is uh, very wisely trying to just figure out whether it represents probabilities without trying to give a general account of what it represents. And um, this might just be something to think about in general to what extent his account of probabilistic representation coheres with a more general account of representation or which accounts. Um, I suspect that it coheres with, with many of them. Um, I just wanna ask a question about um, in the invariance condition. So you might think in certain kinds of creatures, they might be able to represent probabilistically without having a unified representation of uncertainty. So they might have a separate representation of uncertainty for contrast and another one for spread or some other variable. And those um, representations might only get combined but never be pooled together for an overall uncertainty and might just be pooled together at the end when it's making its decision. And so what would we want to say about a creature like that? Why would we want to deny that it has probabilistic representation? Or is there some other condition it can satisfy that leads us to say it has probabilistic representation? Um, just about the marginalization condition, which says that only when, when representations are being marginalized over, do they count as probabilistic? Um, you know, you can think about other conditions that seem plausible as well, like maybe um, there's no marginalization, but maybe the weights given to certain measurements in the brain are being calibrated to the frequencies in the environment. And why not think that's sufficient for a probabilistic representation, even in a creature that's incapable of marginalizing? Say, for example, there's just a set number of categories, each of which is weighted, and then it makes a decision on its basis. Um, why well, think it has to be able to um, combine weights in a way consistent with marginalization? And just sort of the last is just a general question about marginalization. And um, so it's part of the, th the count that subsequent part, um, systems are able to marginalize over the representation, but it'd be nice to hear more about how we could figure out whether a part of the brain is doing marginalization, the kinds of mechanisms that we should be looking for in the brain that can accomplish marginalization. Um, I know that's something Raphael is starting to think about, but it's a part of the project that would be um, very fruitful uh, to fill out. So that's it from me. Thank you so much, Professor Morrison. Raphael, would you like to respond to um, the many questions that were just posed to you? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll hold off on re responding um, directly to any of them and just say that I think it illustrates what's so great about the program, which is not only am I having conversations with, um, with Nico and John about philosophy of neuroscience, but they're meeting without me all the time and working on this stuff. And, and sometimes you might be surprised that, that how the which topics are discussed with whom so I, I might Nico might tell me about a philosophy paper that he thinks I should read and I might be going over you know Python code with with John and it really has been interdisciplinary um, I want to add one thing which is uh, Mike sent a, a very good question in the chat I for some reason I can't reply to you privately um, but maybe I'll, I'll read that first when we get started with the questions don't want you to think I'm ignoring you uh, please do, actually, because I think he didn't send it to the rest of us. So go ahead and read it out, and uh, you can answer. So the question is, why assume probabilities are represented at all? Must forces be represented for me to stand up against gravity? Um, which I, I think is a great metaphor um, for the, the kinds of issues we're dealing with. So part of the motivation for, for focusing on this sort of light, life cycle of a probabilistic representation, where it, it represents a multiple possible things and then it's collapsed over is to avoid notions of probabilistic representation that are just like, oh, you're following some gradient that's given by a statistical model 
And because those turn out to be arbitrary, like you can always write that gradient in a way where it could have been derived from probability. So we really want to focus not on maximizing probability or, or maximizing log probability, but on, on re actually representing probability in the activity. I don't know if that answered your question at all. I got it. I got a shrug. That's pretty good. If Mike, uh, that's Mike Shadlin. Um, if you want to um, come on and uh, respond to that or have a conversation, I encourage you to do so. But otherwise, um, others, um, other questions. I would say that it was a good probabilistic answer. I, I think I'm <laughs> about 0.27 convinced. I will take that. Um, any other questions, um, comments that um, either you, Raphael, or Matt want to respond to? We have a little chance for discussion in the last about four minutes of our, we've um, admirably finished all of these presentations so we, um, on time, so we have a little bit of time. Matt or Raphael? Yeah, just briefly, John said something about how does this fit in with um, a broader notion of representation. And it's a, a great question. I think he, he got it right. We're basically trying to build a framework that works. You can just plug into your favorite philosophical or neuroscientific um, theory of representation. And then separately, I didn't have time to discuss it today, but we've done a lot of work trying to come up with a hybrid neuroscientific philosoph philosophical notion of, of representation in general, um, which turns out to be um, pretty, pretty difficult. Well, I um, think that we need to leave it there now. And I simply want to thank all of our really wonderful scholars um, today, our really incredibly dedicated and interesting mentors, and all of the audience for joining us today. So thank you all for being here.